Good morning and welcome from the Kailed River Seventh-day Adventist Church, your light in the neighborhood. We are delighted that you have chosen to join us this morning for our worship service. And we trust that as we pray, sing and listen to God's word, that we will find the blessing that God has planned for each one of us. Enjoy the worship with us and may God bless you. Father God, Jehovah, Chaira, the creator and sustainer of our lives. On this Sabbath morning, we humbly and unworthy approach your throne of grace, knowingly that you care for your children. O Lord, accept our prayers today as we confess our sins against you. Wash us in the blood of the Lamb that was slain for sinners such as I. I come to worship you because thou art worthy to be praised. It's so good to know the Lord, and it's so precious to be in His presence and to be part of the family of God. Today, Lord, we live in a world full of turmoil and distress, but we as your children are hopeful and faithful because we serve a God who knows the future and will lead your children safely through the storm. Lord, may the Holy Spirit inspire and speak to our hearts through your 
servant who will present your message. Fill us with peace and love for you and one another. May your church through this message be reminded of the mission in this world today. Make each and every one of us a light bearer so that your name may be glorified above all names. I pray for every family and leaders of our church at last. Lord, we have a mission and a commission. May the Holy Spirit help us to fulfill this mission. I want to thank you for your protection, Lord, through thou art worthy. Crown thee as I crown thee as king of my life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your goodness. Amen. Dear Lord, I know you are the owner of the universe, totally able to do anything. If this child will later enlarge Satan's lines, please allow him to rest. But if he will serve you, please perform a miracle. I now give up my desire to get money to become rich. I rededicate myself to serve you my whole life, doing whatever you want me to do and going wherever you send me. I will also dedicate this child to you and will prepare all my other children to serve you. This prayer came from a desperate father while his baby son who was near death was having surgery. Not too long before that, Oswald Dino, who was studying at the Adventist Seminary in Sao Paulo, Brazil to become a pastor, almost left God's call due to his desire for wealth. He was considering a friend's proposal to partner with him in purchasing a gas station when his son Marcos became very sick. During that meaningful prayer in one of the hospital's restrooms, Oswaldino put his entire life in God's hands. No one can say that Marcos' healing wasn't a miracle, and after that experience, he and his siblings heard the following words from their mom every year. Here is your birthday offering, dear. Please tell your Sabbath school teacher that it was your birthday, and don't forget to give that offering as you do every year. The birthday offering became a meaningful experience of gratitude and rededication to God for this family, which raised two pastors and a pastor's wife. As you return your tithe and give your promise, ask God for a grateful heart that will honor Him throughout every year of life He gives you. May we put our desires last and God first. Good morning, boys and girls. So today our object lesson is titled, With God, All Things Are Possible. And our memory verse is taken out of Mark chapter 10, verses 27. With men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God, all things are possible. Now what I want you boys and girls to go and do for me right now, is go and get an A4 page and a pair of scissors. You can use the safety scissors, but because I'm an adult, I'm a grown-up, I can use a big scissors, okay? I want you to try and make a cut big enough in an A4 sheet of page for your entire body to fit through. <laughs> Exhausted, right? You couldn't do that, neither could I, because we didn't have the master plan and we didn't have the tools that God gave us to solve the problem. Boys and girls, what looks impossible to the human eye is possible with God. Let's go to our story about David and Goliath. You can read this story with your parents tonight in 1 Samuel chapter 17. This story is about a shepherd boy and the champion of the Philistines, a giant Goliath. So David, he was just a normal boy, right? Um, but what made him special was that he spent time with God. So when David faced the mighty, big, angry giant, he wasn't scared at all, even though he was scary, even though Goliath was massive and huge and angry. David knew that God was on his side. So, what had happened was, David was sent to the battlefield 
because he had older brothers who were soldiers and they were in the king's army. So they had to fight the battle, right? So what had happened was David's father sent him to the battlefield to go and send food for his brothers to eat. But when David came to the battlefield, he saw this huge giant. He had this booming, loud voice, and he was shouting at the Israelites, and all the Israelites, they were shaking in their boots. They were so scared of Goliath. Goliath challenged the Israelites. He said to them, Send me a champion. Choose any man to fight me, and if I win, then the Philistines win. But if your champion wins, then we will lose the battle. Goliath, after he said that statement, he cursed God. I'll fight him, said David. Then the soldiers took David to the king. King Saul saw that David was only a boy, but he was a boy with great courage and armed with the power of God. When Goliath saw David, puny little David walking onto the battlefield, he started laughing. He laughed so much <laughs> that he removed his helmet off from his head. When he saw the stick, he shouted at David and said, What are you doing with that stick? Do you think I'm a dog that you would chase me? David took one pebble and he put it inside of his sling and he started swinging it above his head. <clears throat> While he was swinging the sling, Goliath was still laughing, but he wouldn't be laughing for much longer. God's power, because God's power was inside of David. God's power was inside the sling. God was with his people. As David swung the sling up into the air, it landed straight onto Goliath. Deadly blow, Goliath fell down to the ground. He was defeated. The Philistines were defeated. The Israelites had won and David was the champion. Girls, Jesus loves you more than you could ever imagine. He wants you to talk to him just like you would to your closest friend. He wants you to bring your impossible situations to him because he can solve them. God is the one, boys and girls, with a master plan. And he gives us the tools to help solve the problems in our life. The tools in your life are your parents, the Bible, your siblings, your teacher, and people in your community. Those are the people who help you in difficult situations. Let's see if our, if our master plan has worked out. So I made all of our cuts in an A4 size page. I didn't cut anything away from it. So let's see if this worked. Open it up. Oh, okay, so let's open it up. Boys and girls, sometimes I'm going to put this around my neck. <laughs> Boys and girls, sometimes when we are talking to God and we are trusting in Him to help us work through our problems, things take a bit longer than we would like. Just because we are waiting on God doesn't mean that He is not solving our problems. It doesn't mean that God isn't working on a solution. Maybe your problem is that you went locked down to end. You might be so frustrated that you are stuck at home all the time and that you can't play with your friends. You might not know how to solve your problem, but God does. All we have to do is be patient, be obedient, and trust in the process. So maybe you would like to pray this prayer with me. Let's close our eyes. Thank you, Lord, that you love us, and that you are strong enough to help us with our problems. Help us to talk to you and to trust in you. These things I pray in your loving name. Amen. Sitting at the feet of Jesus, oh, what words I hear him say.
Happy place, so near, so precious. May it find me there each day. Sitting at the feet of Jesus, I would look upon the past. For His love has been so gracious. It's my privilege to be God's messenger this morning and I trust that as we will spend time around God's word, it will be a blessing to all of us. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for the privilege that we have to be of service for you. We thank you for the gift of the Sabbath, the privilege of worship, and as we will spend time around your word, open our hearts to hear the word of God in Jesus' name. Amen. Fear not, for I am with you, says the Lord. Isaiah 43 verse 1. But now, this is what the Lord says. He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. Verse 2. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Verse 4, since you are precious and honored in my sight, and because I love you, I will give men in exchange for you and people in exchange for your life. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. This is a bold promise, right? Given the pandemic we are living through. Not so? None of us have been 
unaffected. We either know of someone who have lost a loved one through COVID-19, we have either gotten sick and recovered ourselves, or a family that have gotten sick and recovered. All of us know of somebody affected by COVID-19. So many deaths each week. We are reeling from this impact. I'm not sure about you, but going to the shop for groceries is a scary thing. We hardly want to touch any surface. I'm uncomfortable if anybody doesn't keep their social distance. Not fear? Really? No one is immune from trials, tribulations, troubles and distresses in their lives. These things affect us all. Jesus said, these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. John 16, 33. Notice the words, when you, in verse 2. This doesn't mean if. It means when. Inevitable. You may try to avoid the waters and the rivers and the fire, but you won't be successful. You will either do it with God or alone, but you will go through it. And remember, if God's will brings you to it, his grace will bring you through it. We do not all go through the same waters. Some of us will go through the water of sickness, some of discrimination, some physical or mental handicap, some through abuse, some extreme poverty, some betrayal of some sort, all go through different things and through the rivers. Throughout life, we have rivers to cross. There will be times when our faith is not as strong as it should be. Sometimes when sorrow and grief seem greater than we can bear and times when the challenges facing us come when our strength is already gone. But there is a promise here they will not overflow you. Even though you will pass through the waters, some very deep and dark rivers at that too. Rivers that threaten to overflow you and dash you against the rocks hidden from your view. God's promise is sure, friends. They will not overflow you. Believe it. And then we walk through the fire. I was looking up what through the fire means. It's a process of burning, a changing from one substance to another. There was a woman who called up a silversmith and made an appointment to watch him at work. She didn't mention anything about the reason for her interest in silver beyond her curiosity about the process of refining silver. As she watched the silversmith, he held a piece of silver over the fire and let it heat up. He explained that in refining silver, one needed to hold the silver in the middle of the fire where the flames were the hottest to burn away all the impurities. The woman thought about God holding us in such a hot spot. Then she thought again about the verse in Malachi 3 verse 3, that he sits as a refiner and purifier of silver. She asked the silversmith if it was true that he had to sit there in front of the fire the whole time the silver was being refined. The man answered, yes. He had not only had to sit there holding the silver, but he had to keep his eye on the silver the entire time it was in the fire. If the silver was left even a moment too long in the flames, it would be destroyed. The woman was silent for a moment. Then she asked the silversmith, how do you know when the silver is fully refined? He smiled at her knowingly and answered, oh, that's easy, when I see my image in it. I don't know about you, 
But I think we are going through the refiner's fire lately with all these things that are going on around us. It's just a little trial here and a trial there. It's just fire for the purifying process. As we study the history of Israel, you will find that God always made a way for them. He made a way to get them out of Egypt. He made a way for them to cross the Red Sea. He made a way for them to cross the wilderness. And he made a way for them to go into the promised land. Deuteronomy 1 verse 21. See the Lord your God has given you the land. Go up and take possession of it as the Lord, the God of your fathers told you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Deuteronomy contains a distinct message spoken to the Israelites by Moses just before he dies. The Israelites have wandered 40 years in the wilderness. They are standing on the banks of the Jordan River where their forefathers had failed miserably 40 years prior. As they stand at their place of greatest failure, Moses is strongly admonishing them to obey God who has been and will continue to be faithful to them. The Israelites must make an all-important decision about their future as they stand on the brink of the promised land. They stand at the point between their past history of disobedience and their potential future obedience. Forty years of aimless wandering and failure motivates them to emphasize God's ability to provide success. We find the mandate of God's being made crystal clear to his chosen people. Look, see the land that I have given to you, just as I promised your fathers. Go up and possess it. Claim it with all the abundance and fulfillment that I desire for you. Do not fear and do not be discouraged. Yet, after having come so far, after having prevailed over Pharaoh and his army, after crossing on dry land to the other side of the Red Sea, after successfully journeying through the wilderness places, the Israelites simply could not cross the finish line. Their final obstacle, fear, got the best of them. The Israelites were standing in the very place of their greatest failure. It had taken them 40 years to make an 11-day journey. They are surrounded by reminders of their past failures. They were facing the same river and the same enemy. You can only imagine the emotional war raging within their minds. Knowing your strength is great, but understanding your weaknesses is even greater. Actually, it's much scarier. Moses did not want them to use their failure as an excuse for not trying again. You may not be able to recoup the losses, undo the damage, or reverse the consequences, but God will allow you to make a new start. Hallelujah. This time, you can be wiser. You can be more sensitive and more determined with the help of God to do right. I am here to tell you this morning that you, too, may be standing on the threshold of God's greatest promise for you. You need to know that you will never claim God's blessings if you allow fear to dominate your life. Paul in 2 Timothy 1.7 tells us, For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. You see, fear robs us of our perspective of things. It destroys our viewpoint and it brings the worst side of us out into the open. Fear brings out complaining, distrust, finger pointing and despair in people. God had provided the Israelites with victory over the Egyptian oppressors. He delivered them through their wilderness experiences. Doesn't fear affect us all in that same way? You see, fear spreads like wildfire among the people. Fear causes us to lose the ability to see clearly, to see things in their true perspective. I'm sure you, just like I have, have received all these panic 
messages through the different forms of media, different ways to stay safe, different ways to eat, different ways to of conspiracy theories, all these things strike strike fear in our hearts. True perspective is what is called for. It is fear itself, not the object of that fear that destroys us, playing on our minds and causing us to deny the power of God in our lives, to give us the victory. You see, fear causes us to lose sight of the precious promise found in Philippians 4 verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The greater our fear becomes, the weaker our reasoning ability becomes. You see, fear distorts God's purposes in our lives. E.G. White on fear says, Faith takes God at his word, not asking to understand the meaning of the trying experiences that come. But there are many who have little faith. They are always fearing and borrowing trouble. Every day they are surrounded by the tokens of God's love. Every day they enjoy the bounties of his providence, but they overlook these blessings. The golden dreams, the hopes and aspirations of the Israelites for a secure land and a new beginning were ruined for an entire generation because of the majority report of 10 out of 12 who didn't think that they could overtake the land. Be careful of the majorities. It was the crowd who had thrown palm branches that said crucify him. In Deuteronomy 1 verse 29, then I said to you, do not be terrified. Do not be afraid of them. Verse 30, the Lord your God who is going before you will fight for you as he did for you in Egypt before your very eyes and in the desert. There you saw how the Lord carried you as a father carries his son. All the way you went until you reached this place. Verse 32, in spite of this, you did not trust in the Lord your God. 33, who went ahead of you on your journey in fire by night and in a cloud by day to search out places for you to camp and to show you the way you should go. The Israelites were not facing some mysterious unknown entity. Something that came out of nowhere, demanding that they place their trust in untested or uncharted waters. This was the same God who had remained steadfastly by their side, who had provided for their every need, providing even food in the desert, manna daily, double portion on the Sabbath. He had already proved himself over and over again. God had ordered their steps all the way, nurturing them, protecting them, doing everything possible to establish a fully trusting relationship. Yet, when push came to shove, they simply could not pass the test. What makes it worse was the fact that it was an open book test. They had everything that they needed to pass the test in front of their very eyes. They had seen God in action. They had witnessed miracle after miracle. Isn't that just like us? We ought to be able to look back upon our lives and say, God has brought me a very long way. He's brought me this far. He surely will be able to bring me home. It's what the Israelites should have said, but they failed the test. How about you and me this morning? Will we fail the test too? You know, we can let fear overtake us as we look at the things in front of us. We can tremble at what we see in the headlights. However, if we just take a moment to look in our rearview mirrors, perhaps our memory of things past, when God brought us through, when God opened doors where there were no doors, when God made a way out of no way, just perhaps, we will be able to change our perspective and it will give us courage to trust God in our current situation. 
Fear causes us to disbelieve God's promise that I will never leave you nor forsake you. You see, God tells us over and over again, fear not. A simple two-word phrase. That is an absolute command from him to overcome our fear with his promise. God is in control of everything. What to do? Steps to Christ, page 100, says, Keep your wants, your joys, your sorrows, your cares, and your fears before him. You cannot burden him. You cannot weary him. Our precious, our loving Savior. When we go to Isaiah 43, notice the phrase in verse 16 and verse 19, Make a way. Verse 16, this is what the Lord says. Ye who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and horses, the army and reinforcements together, and they lay there, never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. Our focus for, for now, verse 18 and 19, forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. So what is that? I am doing a new thing, God says to us. We like new things, don't we? There's always something new, something different, something better than what we have right now. A new phone, a new computer, new clothes. There's always new technology, new styles, lots of new things. This morning God says, I am doing a new thing. So what is this new thing that God is doing? How can anything related to Christianity be a new thing? I thought Christianity was an old thing. A religion that has been around for almost 2,000 years. Something from the past, something becoming more and more obsolete. What does God mean when he says, I am doing a new thing? In verse 18, God says, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. Do you know the setting of these words? These words were originally written to be words of comfort for people in captivity. But God says, do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? God was telling the people that while he did some amazing things for them in the past, they haven't seen anything yet. He was going to rescue them again. I am making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. God's people were trapped in a country that was surrounded by one of the most barren, most deadly deserts in the world. Even if they escaped from their captors, they would never make it through the desert. But God was going to do the impossible. He was going to set up a highway for them to walk on. He was going to provide water for them as they journeyed back to the promised land. This is the new thing that God eventually did for his people. They were eventually released from captivity. They eventually survived that difficult trip through the desert and returned to their homeland. What does this have to do with me? God says, I am making a way in the desert. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. God says, I am making streams in the wasteland. Yes, God is ready to do the same for us during this crisis. He is our highway in the pandemic desert. He is our oasis, our stream in the wasteland. Jesus is the new thing that God is doing for us. This is a new thing. Yes, we have never lived through a pandemic. And God says, fear not, for I am with you. And I am about to do a new thing. Today, I am looking for that new thing. I'm looking for a renewed relationship of faith in Him. I'm looking for a new way to worship Him. I'm going to trust God anew and have no fear. Amen.
close our eyes and pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we praise you for the promises in your word and the wonderful assurance that you give us that we do not need to be afraid. Fear does not have to rule our lives. Amidst the pandemic, amidst the uncertainty, amidst the chaos of the world around us, Lord. Lockdown, isolation, quarantine. We realize that there is a God who is about to renew our lives. My prayer this morning is, Lord, that we will grab hold of the promises of God and that we will allow our faith to be bigger than our fear and that we will trust the God that has promised us that he will bring renewal into our lives and that this too shall pass. We pray this in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. May the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the sweet fellowship and the communion of the Holy Spirit abide with each one of us both now and forevermore. Amen.